He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Thank you for that. Welcome to our church. If you're visiting with us, we thank you for allowing this hour to be a blessing in your lives as it will be in ours. Not too much by way of announcement. As you see, all of Christmas has been put away, sadly, for another few months. Maybe we'll get it out in July for a while, because I get to missing it by that time. Uh, yeah, the only thing I have is this. Our opening hymn this afternoon, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, was written by James Montgomery. He born in 1771 in Scotland and uh, lived almost all his life in Sheffield in England. When he was a youngster, uh, eight or nine years old, his parents took ship to the West Indies as Moravian missionaries and within a year had died of fever. And so Montgomery was orphaned and uh, was at boarding school. Finally, he ran away from there, frankly. He was apprenticed to a baker, that didn't work. Apprenticed to a shopkeeper, that didn't work. Went down to London and tried his hand in literary circles, that didn't work. Moved back to Sheffield and uh, began work there as, uh, as a kind of a copy boy in the local newspaper. And after the owner was uh, threatened with jail and had to leave the country, well, Montgomery took over the paper. And he was uh, a little bit of a liberal in those days and, for example, published a, a poem in his paper uh, lauding the fall of the Bastille and the French Revolution and all of that. So he was jailed twice in his time, too. Uh, he is remembered for his stances published uh, as anti-slavery, early anti-slavery advocate. And also, uh, the boys who were chimney sweeps were a concern of his, and so he did a little bit of charity work regarding them as well. Published nine volumes of poetry in his time and 400 hymns. We have uh, four of them in LSB. You know, Angels from the Realms of Glory, Go to Dark Gethsemane, and in a minute, you're gonna know this one. Let's rise and sing.
We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord reveals Jesus as his son. The voice of the Lord reveals his children too. In holy baptism, each of us was baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In baptism, we were united with Christ, yet we have often lived as if we were entirely independent and autonomous. We have lived as if our identity were not in Jesus, but in our own selfish desires. Yet our Heavenly Father invites us to turn back to Him and ask for His forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we confess that we are by nature sinful and have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Jesus, us, us, and unite us to you. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die and rise for you. In baptism, you were united to Christ in both his death and resurrection. You were buried with him but also raised to walk in newness of life. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized in his name faithful in their calling as your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our epistle reading for today is from the sixth chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Paul is reminding the church in Rome, and he's reminding us also of the true meaning of baptism. What should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him in baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Remember last week's Easy Hymns? I told you I'd get you. It's today. 
Our gospel message this evening from the first chapter of the gospel according to Mark. Please rise to receive it. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt round his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. And now together we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Hard to sing, but a great song. Great song. The Gospels, did you know this? They all kind of begin in different places. The story of Jesus is uh, not told from the same starting point by the, the three synoptic Gospels and John's Gospel on through the rest of his life. No, they, they start in different places, don't they? Well, and, and so you think about this. Matthew begins with a genealogy. As he points out to his audience, likely largely Jewish, that, uh, that the Holy Family, Jesus himself, can be traced in his generations all the way to Abraham, to the promise that God made to Abraham that a seed of yours will be the one. And then, of course, Luke begins with uh, an introduction to his patron, who, uh, I suppose, supported him in some way during the time of writing his two books, uh, but then immediately begins way back before Jesus is born, too, right, with with the angel coming to Zechariah and announcing that you, even in your old age, you and Elizabeth will be having a child and you're going to name him John, whether you want to or not. And John, Gospel John, <laughs> starts at the beginning, right? Before the beginning of time, right? Was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and boy, John starts way back. Mark, we're in tonight. Beginning with the baptism of Jesus, particularly meaningful for Mark. We'll look just a little deeper maybe at that. <laughs> Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from his son Jesus, the Christ. Well, the gospel according to Mark begins, if you kind of get closer to the Greek, with, with these words. The beginning of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you could go all the way back to the third chapter of Genesis and say, well, that's the beginning of the preaching of gospel of, of Jesus Christ, right? As God said to Adam and Eve, and oh, by the way, to the snake, hey, there's one coming and he's going to deal with all three of you in different ways. But that was a promise, and it was a gospel promise that, that God made so far back. And you know, Mark might also be referring to, to John, who preached. We just read that, right? John preached to the people about a repentance through a washing of water. And then he said, one will come along and whose uh, who's straps of his sandals I am not fit to tie and he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Elsewhere it says, and with fire. And so Mark starts us off that way. The beginning of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, after having said that sentence, he says, Mark does, it stands written in Isaiah, the prophet, and he's, he starts with a sentence not from Isaiah, but from Malachi. And so he says in the NIV, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. And then he switches to Isaiah. And I'm not exactly sure why Mark, perhaps under Peter's influence, uh, decided to do this. But you know, it's not uncommon. Paul does the same thing. He pulls quotations out of the Old Testament and he places them together maybe in places they weren't together in the OT, but he pulls them together in ways and in places that serve us in our desire to understand who this Jesus is. And so he says, he begins with Isaiah and Malachi, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And then he takes a little bit of a leap of time, doesn't he? He says, again, it came to pass. Then it came to pass. John comes on the scene. John the baptizer, having grown up the child of, of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the very one who, who he leapt in utero when the pregnant Mary walked into Elizabeth's house. You remember that from Luke? It came to pass. John came. Baptizing in the desert region, 
preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, it's important to Mark to, uh, to illustrate a difference between the baptisms. That baptism for the repentance of sin, that's not a Christian baptism that John is doing. But something amazing happens when Jesus steps down into the Jordan and baptism forever has a, not only a different connotation but a different content. The whole Judean countryside, all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt round his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. You know why he said wild honey? Domesticated honey was taxed. John didn't want to pay taxes. I'll see you on April 15th. Well, he found a legal way around it. I'm going to leave that to him. This was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whom sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Nowhere in Scripture does it say how many people heard and witnessed all of that, but there were surely some there because people from Jerusalem and all Judea were coming out there to be baptized by John in this baptizing for for the forgiveness of sin, for repentance, for the forgiveness of sin. You know what? It's kind of how we start too in our confession, right? We acknowledge our sinfulness. We state our desire to repent of it. And God has promised that he will forgive those sins, and sure he does. Well, why are these moments important to us? So this is... Uh, 500 years old, painted about 1520, I think, by a Flemish painter. And um, there's a lot going on in this picture. Now, we're in church here. We're not here for art lessons. I realize that. As you look at this picture, though, you recognize that the painter has three different time zones in his painting. And so here is John, and he is preaching this baptism of repentance for forgiveness to the people who have come out to him at the Jordan. And then maybe I'll do this. You can't see it from over there. And then here in the background is the figure of Jesus. And how do I know that? Because the cloak he is wearing in the next little time slot is here on the ground next to John. This is the same color cloak. There's so much going on in this picture. There are, there are four lizards here. Look at the flower next to Jesus' heart. In the back, I do believe this is a rendition of the tomb of Jesus. There's a fisherman over here. There's an egret here. And so here is the next little time zone in this painting, and it is John. And what is he doing here? He is sprinkling water. You can't see it from where you are. But the painter has included drops of water coming from his hand. I find that interesting. The idea that Jesus must have been fully immersed is a fine concept, and I'm okay with all of that. But I'm not sure that it was entirely biblical. And so the whole Baptist community, all the non-denoms in the world, they insist on a full immersion baptism, and that's fine. If you want to be baptized in your swimming pool or, or in the ocean, I've done that too. That's okay. We here understand because Scripture does not delineate for us the amount of water we must use. We recognize that any quantity of that ancient stuff that God has made, water, any quantity together with the word that Jesus told us to say, all of that constitutes a Christian baptism.
You know, in the next time zone, here is the river of life flowing past these two and out into the distance. Why are these moments important to us? You know, in Jesus' life, we share only a couple of things with him. He was fully human while fully God. And so he had all of the temptations and perils that we have. But he was sinless. We do not share that with him. We share this baptism with him. These two men, one of them fully God while fully man, the other only a man, stand at the crossroads of the Old and the New Testament. And you and I are standing right there at that curb on that sidewalk, right there with them, where the New Testament comes in in Jesus' person and work and his word and takes from the Old Testament all that was true and valid and brings it forward and, and gives it to us. And in these moments, and here's, here is God at the top of the painting, and that's the dove coming down. You and I share that with Jesus. Think of that. You don't share much with Jesus, not his sinlessness. But you do share the truth that in your baptism, in your Christian baptism, the Holy Spirit came to you, not like a dove, but in a way that we frankly can't understand and that people have tried for centuries to picture. We have been baptized, as Paul says, into a death like his. And yet, as the waters of baptism recede from our heads, we are brought up out of that death into a new life. We share that with Jesus. That's why these moments are important to us. Because of the intersection of the old and the new, and the living out right in front of us of the promises that God has made ever since that third chapter of Genesis, through the promise to Abram and, and on and on. And there it is. There is the embodiment of the promise that we have of eternal life. And the only reason we have that realization, that in our hearts, that understanding, hope is too small a word, but that's the one we use, this is the reason why we have that understanding and hope through God's grace of a life in eternity with him. This is what we share with Jesus. These are the things that are important in these moments. That's us then, sailing on down through our lives, having had the reassurance from God himself in his water and in his word that his purpose for us is perfect. He calls us into a faith through his grace by, by the gift of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. This is a starting point for all of that. Think of those three fast years between this moment with John, the little water sprinkling on his head, the dove from heaven, the Lord speaking. Think how fast it went between that and this cross. Three years goes quickly, doesn't it? For us, it's the three best years of our lives because the promise for us happens here. The realization from it happens not in the death on the cross, but in the resurrection from that death. That's why these moments are important to us. It's, um, and that's why I gave you a picture from, from about 1520. You know, the guy that painted this was a friend of Albrecht Durer's. You know who he is? The German engraver. And, and would, I am certain, have been influenced by Luther and the Protestant Reformation. This was painted by a Flemish guy in the Low Countries. And, and that's why I think it looks familiar to us. A little bit of water. Jesus, very human. God watching over all. In Jesus' name. Amen.
please be seated. If you were on the ballot in November as an officer of the congregation or an elder or a trustee, will you please come forward now? Just up here, don't be shy, there's four of you around here. Here come some elders, here comes an officer. Anybody else? Oh yeah, here's one, good. Okay. Don't be concerned that they are masked men. <laughs> All y'all are masked men. Yeah, it's just kind of in a sense. Come on, Greg, step back a little bit. Yeah, yeah, there you go, in a line. Okay. He's one of the financial guys. I'm concerned that he can't stand in a line straight. <laughs> so these are uh, elders and a trustee and an officer of the congregation. And you notice I didn't give him a microphone, the, you know. But there are a couple of things that I would like to hear from you. And I think the first is, do you recognize this as the inerrant and errorless word of God? If so, please say yes. Thank you for that. Do you pledge to do your utmost using the, the, the ethics and the lesson you have learned from this Jesus and those things that you have learned through your lives and careers? Do you pledge to do your level best to serve these people in this place in the capacities to which you have been called? If so, please say yes. yes. Do you pledge to support them in their work, in their duties, and they won't always make decisions that make you happy? I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Do you pledge to support them in the positions to which they have been called? If so, please say yes. yes. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, I thank you for these who step forward to serve you through serving our people in this place. So, Lord, watch over them. Give them health. Give them discernment. Give them, even when their jobs look a little difficult, Lord, give them the desire to just to do their level best. And watch over them, Lord, as they serve in this year and beyond. All this in Jesus' name. And we all said? Amen. Now, it's not as if the six of them are the only ones around that do any service in this place. So uh, are, there, uh, are there greeters here or ushers? Please stand. Greeters, ushers. There's a bunch of you. There you go. Thank you for that. Good. And stay standing. Are there any altar guild members here? Anybody from the Altar Guild? Yeah, there's at least one. Uh, how about uh, the Flower Committee, Florella? Can you imagine the head of the Flower Committee is named Florella? <laughs> so if we have a mechanics group here, what would we call, I don't know. Any other people on the Flower Committee here present? Uh, what about LWML, Lutheran Women in Mission? Anybody, and, and, okay. Um, there are so many others, uh, Stephen Ministry. Anybody who's in the Stephen ministry here, good. And how about uh, grief care? I know that the head of the grief care right there, good. And how about anybody that works back up there on the technology? How about, yeah, there you go. There's a bunch of you should stand up too. <laughs> there you go, good, thank you. There are so many that, that serve you, you and you in this place. Have I left anybody out, Pastor? What, choir? We have a choir? <laughs> there are Bible, what, yeah. One day we will have a choir. You know, Roger, last thing Roger said was uh, when he was here last time was that his prayer is that we'll have a 40 person choir one day again. There's at least one Bible study leader in this room. Will you stand up please, sir? There are those who serve by leading Bible studies in this place as well. Well, I'm certain I've left some of you out, but the, oh, Don, you're on the counting committee. You stand up. The counting committee, for heaven's sake, we'd have to shut down if it weren't for him. <laughs> and I tell you what, every Monday morning, rain or shine, it does rain here. There's some of you from Nebraska, but I want to just urge, it does rain here. Every morning, Monday, they're here to do the work that needs to be done to keep the lights on and, and, uh, and the walls up in this place. And so, you know, I hope that you will just take a moment to give yourselves a round of applause for the service that you do in this place, please. Thank you for that. Please be seated. Guys, thank you for being here this evening and for doing what you do.
Look at the big, right? <laughs> As we go to the Lord in prayer, we're reminded of those individuals listed in the worship folder, and each of us have individuals on our hearts that we're concerned for. Uh, again this week, our list keeps growing and growing. Uh, we pray for Linda Beck's father, Bill Stewart, who has been diagnosed with COVID, and also a close family friend of the Becks, Tom Brown, who has a very severe case of COVID. Bob Weber's ablation really didn't go as planned, and so next Friday we'll have a cardio version. Mary Kendi's sister Norma and her husband John uh, both have COVID, as well as one of her granddaughters, uh, Catherine. We pray for Ben Snyder for discernment for, for health issues. And then we pray for the family and loved ones of Walt Rohde, who was called home to heaven this past week. And also for the family and loved ones of March Frohlin, Marsha, a former member here at Crown of Life, also called home to be with the Lord this past week. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you manifested yourself with the Holy Spirit in the fullness of grace at the baptism of your dear Son and with your voice directed us to him who has borne our sins that we might receive grace and the remission of sins. Keep us, we beseech you, in the true faith since we have been baptized in accordance with your command in the example of your dear Son, we pray you to strengthen our faith by the Holy Spirit and lead us to everlasting life and salvation. Lord, preserve your holy church here and scatter throughout the world. Give steadfast faith to all Christians by the preaching of your word and through the holy sacraments and send laborers into your harvest. Enliven the love of your saints to bear one another's burdens, to show mercy toward those outside of the church. Quicken us in the hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, give comfort and to relief to those who are sick, depressed, tired, confused, or in any need. Be with those who are near death, that they may hear his son's word of grace in their last hour, and be confident in their baptism, where you name them as your child. Lord, be with all the saints, both here and those departed, keeping us always looking toward the cross and Jesus our Lord. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. We rise as together we sing that family prayer that Jesus taught us.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.